one of the it's very clear, right, that the, the role of religion plays an important part in uh, uh, the life of Arab immigrants and a number of immigrants, right? M many, many different immigrants uh, face, but but particularly the role of the religious institution in society. So that religion is a, a social, cultural uh, uh, organism in, in addition to the faith, but really as a social, cultural organism. And of course you talked about uh, the, the Syrian Orthodox Church, uh, and of course we also know that uh, uh, the Muslim community uh, in Indianapolis, Islamic Society in North America, uh, is based in Plainfield. Talk about the role of religion uh, if you want to expand upon what you talked about in the uh, in the film, sure. So, so I mean, a lot of people. It used to be when we used to think of the melting pot that um, part of becoming American was getting rid of your old tradition. But when it came to religion, it was a completely different story. Part of becoming an American was to have your own religious congregation. Ever since the, great, the Second Great Awakening before the Civil War, the religious congregation, places like this, were the best-funded, most popular voluntary associations in America. They were, before the government provided welfare, they provided welfare, mutual aid, community. So religious congregations, so it wasn't that they were trying to simply preserve and stay the same, they actually needed to invest more in religious congregations when they came to America because to be American was to have a religious congregation. And that's why Arabs end up building churches and mosques or in many cases, for example, here in Fort Wayne, joining existing churches, um, uh, Catholic, Episcopalian, uh, you name it, any of um, all of the Protestants when they came. So... The, the, the religious congregation and religion is so much a part of American identity that by the, by the 1970s, we, we oftentimes see emerging people's voting patterns, for example, are completely linked to their religious identity. And that's when, for example, by the 1990s, we see that white evangelical Christians are the largest single voting bloc in the country. Right? And we see the subsequent decline of the mainline Protestant churches. This was probably a mainline church before it was... It's Presbyterian. Yeah. It's yeah. Presbyterian. Is it still Presbyterian? Yeah, Presbyterian? Okay, uh, I grew up, I, I'm Presbyterian. So, I, you know, so our denomination has decreased in, in, uh, you know, in size over time. Uh, but, yeah, so, but that doesn't mean that religion, until very recently, that religious congregations aren't important. They were central to, not just to immigrant life, to American life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's why they're so important. And so, when you one of the th reasons why in Indianapolis and uh, really across the state of Indiana, we see that people's ethnic identities are not as strong as they used to be, is because religion became organized far more by race than by ethnicity. So most religious congregations in this country are either white or black. Of course, there are brown congregations as well, but not many. Overwhelmingly, the religion and race in our country have now become coterminous. They're both, they're like, they're linked like this. It used to be, it used to be when these, when St. George's was founded in the 20s, right? Catholics would oftentimes go to their Italian Irish parish. In southern Illinois, where I'm from, you'd have a completely Polish Catholic parish. Mm -hmm. you have ethnicity and religion were tied. Mm -hmm. Lutherans were Germanic or Scandinavian, mm -hmm. for example. Right? Mm -hmm. This has changed overall. And now we see as our ethnic identities fade, our racial and our religious identities are regnant. Churches not only as centers of worship, but community centers. Yeah, one of the, one of the mistakes that we as Americans sometimes make is because we're such a Protestant country in the way we think is we think the center of religion is the personal relationship we have with Jesus Christ. And so it's all about the this sort of individualistic relationship with God. Religion has always been about way more than that. 
Yeah. It's not just about doctrine, it's about ethics, it's about institutions, it's about myths, it's about sacred narratives, it's all of those things. And so, you know, um, uh, really understanding the multi-dimensions of religion is important to understanding its function in human societies. As long as we're talking about religion, say a word about the Muslim community of it, the greater Indianapolis. Uh, so the, the, I just... I, I just uh, tweeted something uh, that became very, that blew up a bit. Uh, the first Muslim congregation in Indianapolis was founded by Ahmadi missionaries, missionaries from the Punjab in British India. They were a reform-oriented movement. They're different from Sunni and Shias in, in important ways. But they were the first people to establish a congregation in Indianapolis. Uh, it was very different in the region. What year? That was 1926. By 1931, the, 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 most, the first permanent mosque uh, was established about two or three blocks from Lake Michigan in Michigan City, Indiana. And it is still there today. And you can read about it in my book, Muslims of the Heartland, How Syrian Immigrants Made a Home in the American Midwest. That was really a, a very important center. Um, until until the, after 1965, when there's immigration reform, most Muslim institutions in Indianapolis are established by and frequented by African-American converts to variety of forms of Islam. First the Moorish Science Temple, then the Nation of Islam. Our current, our, our current oldest Sunni mosque, uh, Cold Spring Road, Masjid al-Fajr, traces its route to the late 60s, early 70s. So this relative is very different from the, from, you know, from the region which has a much older uh, Muslim sort of congregation and community. I want to ask you about immigration, kind of, this is not simply about Arab immigrants, but it has to do with just immigrant populations in general. There's always a tension, right, between assimilation, partly because of kind of the great American experiment, mm -hmm. uh, and also maintaining one's cultural traditions. So I want to ask you to just talk about that. You did in the film, but expand upon it a little bit. And also, are you finding, are you finding a difference or a, an evolution between the first generation of immigrants and then the second, third, and fourth generation in terms of, in terms of wanting to really hold on to cultural traditions and stand out even more, or how strong is assimilation? Th those kinds of issues. Absolutely. Yeah, so I already mentioned one thing, that it used to be, in our understanding of immigration, that people responded to the challenges of being in a new country along a sort of um, a, an axis. You either resisted and rejected your new, the new culture, or you, uh, or you assimilated and you, all of your old culture went away. Those of us who study immigration and write about it now, I'm no longer cotton to that way of thinking. We, it's just far too uh, black and white and doesn't really take account. And in fact, as I mentioned before, the way in which these immigrants assimilated to America was to build their ethnic religious congregation. This is very counterintuitive to us to think, now wait a minute, you either have to let go of your traditions and become American or, you know, you, you hold and struggle and you're seen as not American. No, no, no. To become American, you establish a religious ethnic congregation. Now, think about, think about the, the ways in which, in particular, with, with Muslims. Mosques in Syria and Lebanon are a place you go to to pray on Fridays. They are not a place where you have daycare and sports programs and, you know, these kinds of all these kinds of things that we see in the American religious congregation. So on the one hand, you're assimilating because you're building your, com your, your congregation like everyone else, right? And on the other hand, you're also preserving your identity as a, a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, a Sikh, whatever it has. So we now understand a much more dynamic process of assimilation. And the, and the key, in order to become American also, the other key thing about American identity is our race. 
Our racialization is key to who we become in America. It determines so much the kind of people we end up marrying, where we work, where we go to school. I mean, race is as determinative of those things as any other single factor about us. So in the case of the Arabs, we are a liminal population where you have people like Mitch Daniels that nobody knows is Arab, right? He's just a white guy. He's completely racialized as a white person, right? I have never been able to pass as completely white. My skin color has made that impossible for me. And so because we are, Arabs are black, white, and brown, our reception in America very much depends upon how, on our skin color. So that, so we have to deal with we have to deal with uh, external factors in our assimilation. It's not a matter of whether we want to assimilate or not. Like black people at times, we are not allowed to. We are not allowed. To. No matter what you do in this country, there are people, just like you heard about in the film, who will be considered foreign. They could, they could be here their whole... I mean, I still have, I still remember people, I still remember somebody yelling at me, go back to your own country. Well, I'm from southern Illinois. <laughs> okay, I can do that. Um, but but you know so so that so that is key. You know that is very important too. In terms of the preservation of language, food, as you can see, is it is quite remarkable. Food. The, the reason why I end the film with that scene is because more than anything else, if everything goes away. You, you probably, how many of you all have uh, some sort of Arab relatives in your family? Nobody? One person maybe, Lebanese or Syrian? Uh, it's the last thing to go. People still make tabouli, people still make kibbe, you know, it's still, it is, it is, it's amazing how that keeps, you know, somebody could be quote unquote one eight Lebanese and they're still passing along. It's kind of like... A, like there are more Irish people in America than there are in Ireland. You know, I mean, that's that kind of, you know, that, that kind of tradition is very strong. The language always depended upon whether, first of all, there was a critical mass of Arabic-speaking people around you. My mother does not speak Arabic because there was not in Cairo and Mounds, Illinois, where she grew up. However, I know people who, uh, from Dearborn... Mm -hmm. who, who were born in this country and have never been to the Arab world who are fluent in Arabic. Right. So it really very depends on who's around you and whether or not there are first generation immigrants continuing to sort of further the connection oftentimes. But now you don't even need the physical connection because of global communications. You can stream any Arab media you want into your living room. And so that has enabled the, the, the passing on of language. Plus, if language, because religion is such an important identity, if language is important to your religion, as it is in Islam, the Arabic language, the Quran is revealed in Arabic, it has a, it has a function, then, it, then you send your kids to learn Arabic at, the, at Sunday school. They actually go on Sundays oftentimes. And, um, you know, or Saturday school, and that helps to perpetuate language, which is another marker of the kind of identity. So those are just some of the sort of, you know, that's some of the dynamics of the assimilation versus resistance kind of thing. There have been a couple questions. I, I, I want to get to questions, but I want to just uh, uh, make mention that uh, this man's work that you saw this morning and his presence among us today is partially funded by a grant from Indiana Humanities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that's an important note to make. Uh, I have one more question, and then we're going to open it up. Okay, uh, or maybe two, but then we'll, we will open it up. Uh, as long He's as, got two doctorates. So what do you want? As long as you, uh, as, as long as you brought up food, I don't know how much you want to say about this. You want to say anything about the hummus wars or cultural appropriation of food? Well, yeah, because we're at the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so uh, well, as you may know, you know there's. Um, Food, because it's so much a marker of cultural identity, um, has a politics to it. It has political meaning and significance. Mm -hmm. And so, so one of the things that Arabs tend to do, be protective of 
is their food. And uh, we, don't, we don't much like it when we feel like it's being appropriated in various ways. And I've gotten in trouble, some trouble as a, as a pro-Palestinian activist at times defending hummus from its appropriation to support the occupation of Palestine. Mm. So, I, so that, that's, uh, that's where um, you know, the best hummus competition... Hummus, of course, is an Arabic word, which means chickpea. Uh, that's what it means. And uh, and I'll just I'll just leave it at that. But yes, our food can be. And there's also the politics of which Arab foods do you uh, intra Arab? That you notice that in that dinner, for example, um, or that lunch, we intentionally, uh, even though none of us has North African roots, we intentionally cook some things from North Africa because we want to recognize there are actually more Arabic speakers in Africa than in Asia or the quote unquote Middle East. Yeah. Before most of these folks got involved in the Indiana Center, there's a handful who were here from the very start, but we got really severe blowback from the local Jewish Federation when we advertised uh, uh, Arabic, uh, Arabic foods and Arabic sweets at some of our uh, uh, more public events like hummus and, other, and shawarma and others. So, I mean, that's something that's very... The hummus wars and cultural appropriation very, very uh, 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 present in my thinking. So I'm well, not... and the way and the thing to the way to explain this is it, it's not it's not that it's Jewish or Muslim or Christian, right? It's it's Middle Eastern and Muhammad is, is Eastern Mediterranean and all the people from Druze, Sunnis, Shias, Christ, Christians of various sorts, Jews, they all ate hummus, right? The di the difference is is when it's when it's harnessed to a particular nationalist project. Sure. That's the problem. It's a, we have to always we always have to celebrate the fact that our Arab traditions are multi-religious and 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 multivalent, you know, and and that and that Jews have always been a part of the Arab world, not separate from it. One last question, then we'll open up. It was referred to in the film uh, about. Uh, um, the prejudice and name calling intolerance, even hatred uh, uh, of the other. Uh, not only Arabs, but, but uh, other immigrants. You talked about uh, the, necess the necessity or the impossibility of becoming white. Talk a little bit about, expand upon the kind of prejudice that Arabs have faced and continue to face in uh, Middle America, particularly. Well, and it's, uh, I wish it were just Middle America. Yeah. Then we could easily move to the East or the West Coast and be done with it. It's, an, it's uh, you know, it really comes from Puritan New England in the 1600s. So it's, it's an anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, anti-Turkish, um, uh, anti-Oriental, I'd say, is a, um, prejudice. is really uh, part and parcel of American culture, and it has been since the colonial era. And the same stereotypes that are uh, shouted out today, were sh many of them were shouted out by people like Cotton Mather, the Reverend Cotton Mather in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, we're associated with, uh, with, the, um, with the end of the world sometimes, mm -hmm. and the coming, of the, the coming back of Jesus. You know, and so the, the, the demise of the Ottoman Empire in particular was oftentimes associated with the idea that Jesus would come back. And that's why one of the reasons we have all of those novels like by Tim LaHaye, and, you know, like somehow or another the Middle East is going to be involved in the end times, in the eschaton. So, so, and we're oftentimes uh, uh, have been depicted as the Antichrist figure, yeah. right? Arabs, Muslims, yeah. Turks, some, you know. And so sometimes black people, um, they, they get amalgamated oftentimes. Okay, so that's really from the 600s. Uh, two, we don't like women and we're mean to them. <laughs> Misogynistic. That is, since the 1600s, very strong stereotype associated with Arabs, Muslims, Turks. Okay. Three, we are medieval and unable to adjust to the modern world. Four, that, that, and one of the signs of our medievalism is our, that we are more religious than the average person. We're more fanatical. Right? And that's why we, don't, we can't think straight, like a good enlightenment being. Right? Um, 
and uh, so let's see, violent, anti-woman, irrational, and oddly enough, though, sometimes we're not properly masculine, and we are, and we are depicted like Jamie Farr in MASH, remember MASH, mm -hmm. he's a Lebanese guy from Toledo, you know, as effeminate. Sometimes you know, improperly, just our sexuality is a little bit, you know, uh, you know, a little bit queer. And so, you know, and so these are all, and, and, and that shows up in vaudevilles and that kind of thing. And then finally, we are overly sexual. The reason why there are camel cigarettes is because the camel and the pyramid on the, was associated with the sexuality of the Muslim Orient, right? And so belly dancing, the harem, the cigarettes, Rudy Valentino playing the sheikh in the, in the biggest movie of the 1920s, all of that is the idea that, that somehow that Arabs, Muslims, Turks represent a kind of pleasure that the buttoned up, you know, kind of white person may desire, but it's very dangerous. So those are some of the, those are among, that's kind of in the, if you will, the storehouse or the, the sort of the, the uh, you know, the, the barn uh, that stores all of the, uh, of, of the stereotypes that can be used and reused in various ways for hundreds of years now. Thanks, Edward. Um, yes, Terry, please. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the critical mass element of um, uh, immigrant community. Terry, and, speak up. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I'll pick my hand. <laughs> um, Remove thy hat. Yeah. The critical mass idea of an immigrant community um, and how, like in your, your mention of religion, you know, Fort Wayne, the city of churches, has what were originally, uh, the Catholic cathedral was built by the Irish. There's right across the street practically is the, the Polish church or the German Catholic yeah. church or, you know, so downtown has all these Catholic churches that originally had different uh, ethnic communities that, and uh, today there seems to be a Hispanic um, uh, blossoming, and several of these churches, like this one, um, are retaining the denomination, but becoming um, a congregation of Hispanics, in this case. Uh, Catholic churches, there's a couple of those, too. Um, but the critical mass question that I've got, and I've been working with the arrival of Afghans, for instance, mm -hmm. is that by design, the um, uh, American the governmental placement of refugees in the U.S. scatters them across the country in small mm -hmm. clusters in multiple cities and really makes an effort not to have too big a cluster in any one city. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they, they didn't do that, or secondary migration sometimes destroys that idea, and then you end up with major concentration of Burmese in Fort Wayne and Indianapolis, for instance. Mm -hmm. Even though they came as refugees, they secondarily concentrated where they are. So my question is, Forming that critical mass seems to me to be really a, an important aspect in assimilation. Um, the youth, for instance, having both their traditional background and the opportunity to uh, uh, excel as a group, for instance, in soccer, football to the rest of the world, or whatever the case may be. So I don't know about the Arab community, what their original experience was in the early 20th century. Um, I mean, Dearborn, it was Henry Ford because he was prejudiced against Jews and blacks, you know, brought lots of Arabs in. <laughs> Somehow his prejudice didn't go there. But um, anyway, it's the concentration of a population um, and critical mass. Can you speak to that in what's happening today? Um, in, um, in communities like Indianapolis and Fort Wayne? Sure, and I think you're right that, you know, that, that you said something that was a, a key in my mind, which is that, again, it's one of these uh, paradoxes of assimilation. In order to assimilate, 
which I take, I define assimilation as the ability to participate in your society. I don't see assimilation as somehow as somehow as a uh, a melting away of the self. I don't see assimilation as that. I define assimilation as are you able to participate politically, socially, economically, and culturally in your society? Okay. And the story of the United States from the 1776 until today has been in part the story of the forming of ethnic racial communities that provide the networking, the support, uh, ultimately the power to al allow yourself as a group, as individuals, as a bunch of individuals, to participate in your society. And we all know stories from our past of this. This is why sometimes certain ethnic groups become associated with certain industries, right? I mean, think about think think about how certain. I mean, to, to to name one example, the Irish in Boston, and the police and the fire department. Okay, for example, or priests, or priests. Yeah. That's right. Rome makes the laws. Ireland keeps them. Okay, so it's the old say. Okay, so um, okay, so in the case of Fort Wayne, in 1900. According, if, if, the, if, the, if the census is correct, the vast majority of Arabic-speaking people lived just a couple blocks from the courthouse, which was being built as they got there, and in really in two houses. One, and it, they lived on the second and third floors of those buildings down there. Salem Bashara and Khalil Teens. And I have a piece coming out on the origins of the Arabic-speaking community of Fort Wayne in Traces, which is the magazine of the Indiana Historical Society, uh, very shortly. And I'll share that with you when it comes out. Thank you. And, and so what was their profession? What, was they, what were they networking? Peddling. They, could, they, were, they, were, they really became peddling, and that peddling led, as you hear the story, also it's, so what happened in Indianapolis also happened uh, here to store owning, especially grocery stores. And so when you go to towns like Cairo, Illinois, or Indianapolis, Indiana, or Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or Sioux City, South Dakota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Sioux City's on the other side, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me, South Dakota, I'm so sorry. Um, okay, and you count the number of grocers in 1915 in the city directory, the Arabs, the Syrians and Lebanese mainly, uh, of course there was, uh, they were all Ottoman Syrians at that point, they are way overrepresenting in that, in that, um, and to this day we see a lot of Arabic-speaking store owners, right? I mean, it is a, it is a, you know, it, it is a one. Now they're not the only ethnic group that does this. You know, I mean, of course, the supermarket put the corner grocery out of business, but they still own various stores, right? And so um, this is still going on all over the place. If you go to St. Louis, Missouri. It's the largest single Bosnian community outside of Bosnia. Right. And you will find there, you know, uh, sort of ethnic concentrations, networks. What has generally occurred over time is, as I mentioned before, is oftentimes is if those members of those community can become white or pass as white, then there is less utility, less function, and less meaning in preserving the ethnic difference. So the ethnicity is a claim on power. And once I no longer need to claim that power because I can be white, then it goes away, right? And so yes, we can all still, you know, we can all still have our cabbage and corned beef uh, on St. Patrick's Day, I learned, by the way, that Irish Americans learn that from Jews, by the way. It doesn't come from Ireland. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, you can still have these sorts of, it's not that it goes completely away, but it is no longer as salient. For example, it's not as critical that you marry within your ethnic group anymore. Because marriage is one of the main ways that a community preserves its power and increases it, mm -hmm. right? But if you can just access the power of whiteness, 
then it's not as big a deal. So, we have had in the last two decades a tremendous, uh, a, a very healthy number of sub-Saharan African migrants come to the United States, both from West and East Africa. And uh, what, is, what has already happened, right, is that their children cannot uh, pass as white. Mm -hmm. They increasingly become associated with black America, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and less so with, you know, with being Senegalese. Or, it's not that it can't keep going, it can, two, three, four generations, but they can never just be that. Right? It's, it's, it's generally very hard. They're both. They're Senegalese and they're black. Right? And, so, and so I think you know, what, we, what we see is, again, these patterns that go on. The one exception that may obtain, because we are in the Western Hemisphere, is the Spanish-speaking community. And in places like South Florida and Southern California and Arizona and, and Texas, there are... It is here we have since Spanish is, is the United States second language. We don't we know already that the that the continuing uh, this is a critical mass of people, right? We're talking about tens of millions of people, and that may have a different pattern than these other s relatively smaller groups of migrants or immigrants over time. Please, honey. Um, this is a little bit different, but yeah, please. In the work that Indiana Center for Middle East Peace does, at least it seems in general that, that when we stand up for the Palestinians and the uh, apartheid of what is happening in Israel, we get accused of being anti-Semitic. If you say anything against Israel, you're anti-Semitic. And I have always thought it strange because in Hopefully you can answer this for me. The Semitic people are more than Israelis or Jewish, right? Aren't Arabs considered a Semitic people as well? Yeah, that has been that has been one response to the accusation of anti-Semitism for decades now. Even before I've read I've I've read some people saying this before World War II even. Um, the reason why I will never say that as an Arab American is because I would like to recognize the uniqueness of anti-Semitism in uh, Europe and the United States. I, I don't, I, I, when, when Jews are attacked for being money lenders or controlling the world banking industry or, you know, something, or controlling Hollywood, you know, honestly, that, that, that is not, or you know, or, or Jews to sent to gas chambers, you know, in, in Auschwitz and the other camps. Um, you know, that is not a, my narrative. And anti-Semitism is the word that in the English language that developed in the 1800s very strongly to describe the racism, the anti-Jewish racism that they faced. I can recognize completely the, uh, the history of Western anti-Semitism and of global anti-Semitism. And it takes nothing away from my claims about Islamophobia and anti-Arab bias and about the oppression of Palestinians. So I don't want to appropriate what I do not consider to be mine. Anti-Semitism is the word we use in this country mostly for Jewish anti-Jewish prejudice. I respect that, and I um, and I still believe that actually that we don't teach enough about the Holocaust, for example, in this country. I have students in my college classes who really don't know much about the Shoah, and I'm very sorry to see that because that kind of fascism and what it led to results for Jews and many non-Slavs and, and disabled children and other people, you know, is uh, terrifying to me. Um, and so, let me just, let me finish this, because I think this is an extremely important point. So, what I, what I would say instead is that we have to be bold about, you know, about, and continuing to follow our Palestinian, our Arab, our Jewish allies, in, in play, in, from Jewish Voice for Peace, for example, in saying, look, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. 
That's what we don't have to, we don't have to go, go you, you know. And here's the thing, is, it, it oftentimes surprises me. One of the things that surprises me is how white activists seem to have no idea that anti-Zionism is part and parcel of Arab American identity and has been since the 1930s. And so one of the things, you know, and, and, and I, I think it's that one of the things that white activists can really do is to learn more about and make better relationships with um, Arab American activists. My great grandparents were anti Zionists. Long before most white people learned about this, we, we were doing this work in Cairo, Illinois, where my, in the 1950s, just like your group, my great grandfather George Moses would bring Palestinian activists down to talk about Zionism. So I think we have to be, I think we're at a, at a, a really nice rhetorical moment in a sense. Is we have never had the opportunity to be this explicit because we are seeing the fruits of Zionism now. And let us just be bold and courageous and, and, and claim our anti-Zionism, which is not good for anybody, and, 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 but also continue to fight anti-Semitism. I was just going to ask you, I, I, I'm really grateful to Ani for asking you the question, and I just wanted you to expand upon it a little bit with regard to the... Uh, resolution that's before the Indiana uh, 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 legislature. Yeah, HB 1037. That's right. Which would adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance definition of anti-Semitism, which claims that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Now, we have other much better definitions of anti-Semitism, for example, from our friends at Jewish Voice for Peace, you know, a much more traditional... And I, I really, you know, it's, it's, it's so cynical, in my view, to claim that anti-Zionism is, is somehow producing the kind of anti-Semitic attacks we see against synagogues and Jewish people in this country. I'm absolutely convinced that that's actually the old anti-Semitism, that this is white supremacy, and that attacks on blacks, Jews, Muslims, Arabs, queer people, these are all of a sort, coming from a certain sense of white supremacy. And this is, the, this is what we have, to, we have to battle. So I've been writing, you've been writing, and I hope everyone will write, Senator Ratz, uh, who's the chair of the committee that's considering, and I don't know, I haven't seen um, in the Senate, um, you know, to, to ask him to change, to, to, to not adopt this, because it would mean that people like me could potentially be violating the law if I, for example, teach about anti-Zionism in a in a IUP UI classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Patty, please. Two quick questions. How do you spell his last name? R A A T Z. R A A. He's from uh, he's from Richmond. Maybe we, we we've sent something out asking you to contact your legislators. Uh, we'll we'll do that again. Pam, would you make a note to do that again, please, Patty? And, and my, my my other question, sort of statement with it, is. Uh, sometimes when people use the word to be anti-Semitic, I, I sometimes say to them very kindly, I, I mean anti-Jewish, and I said, which is a very unfair and hateful attitude to have just to be against someone because they're Jewish. Uh, but I, I, I try to be very tactful when I do this. I say, but I said, when you say Semitic, I said, you're, if, you, if it's DNA, Semitic markers, don't, you can't tell someone's religion. You know, anyone who's had ancestors back at the east end of the Mediterranean, you know, most of those people have some Semitic DNA, whatever their religion is. So, and in language, the Semitic is actually a blend of African and Western Asian uh, languages. So I said that the word Semitic is often, I, I'm very polite when I say this. <laughs> I said the word Semitic some, has taken on uh, a, a specific connotation that the word Semitic doesn't actually mean. I said, but anti-Jewish is just be against someone because they're Jewish is a, you know, a, not just unfair, but I hate Yeah, I don't like to tell oppressed people how they should label their oppression. Well, I don't say that to people who are Jewish. Uh, you, see, you see what I'm saying? People. It's just like, it's just like, it's just like on, 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 on people who are non-binary. You know, I don't care what you say. I'm going to call you him. I'm going to call you her. I'm going to, you know, or... Uh, you may want to be black, but no, I'm sorry. You have to be anti. Uh, you're not black. Look at you. You don't have black skin. You're actually dark brown. You see, this kind of rationalization, it doesn't work for me, honestly, because I think it, from my own religious values, I don't understand why, what, what am I giving up 
when I decide to use what is co a commonly understood term, anti-Semitism. I don't understand how that's, since I'm not a victim of anti-Jewish prejudice, I'm a victim of other kinds of prejudice, I don't get what, why that should bother me so much, especially if I'm a white person. What, what is, what's the big deal? Can't we just call it anti-Semitism? Well, people I know who are Semitic, have yeah. Semitic backgrounds, Palestinian people, you know, I mean, other people yeah. are very resentful of that term. That it's okay, well, people, over. you now know another Semite so who is not resentful. <laughs> 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 it's a Semite. I'm a Bekka Arabi. I'm an Arabi at home. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah Marcy, please. Has Thank you, Mike Jen. Pence had any, formed any friendships with the Arab community so he won't be so afraid of them? You know, Mike Pence has never failed to insult us. Uh, when he first ran for Congress, he uh, aired an explicitly anti-Arab ad, a guy dressed as a bad sheik, uh -huh. and uh, accused his opponent of taking money from the uh, oil sheiks. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just, that is not a prejudice that he has ever been able to uh, not abuse. Um, and in fact, Helen Corey, the woman whom you met in this film, uh, she, one of her first sort of um, acts as a coordinator of the National Association of Arab Americans in the state of Indiana was to uh, go on record and criticize Pence for his, uh, his campaign. He's been consistently disappointing. He owes us an apology um, for his racism and for his, and how much he's hurt us, and he has not done so. Nor will he. So he hasn't even... I can't even imagine him seeking out any kind of positive relationship in the Arab community because it feeds his, you know, then his ability to be separated, you know, from any of the Indianapolis people, you know, the doctors and the lawyers and things. He can separate himself from them then. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's disappointing, you know. And I, so, and, I, and I think, by the way, from an activist perspective, now, on the one hand, this is a, uh, I, this is a, I tried to make a bipartisan film, right, in many ways. You know, I mean, there's, there's patriotism in there, there's all kinds of, you know, it's not, it's not, but we have to, they're, 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 we all have our red lines. And when we, when, when we um, express this kind of explicit racism, that Arabs are terrorists, for example, that all people of goodwill should say no. We, 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 we will not support you. That is just not, I mean, that is not okay. And um, we, we, uh, no matter what we're trying to do when we're, when we're building bridges, there are certain places we can't go. And that's, that's one where I'm not willing. And that's why that's the one controversial aspect in the film. That's it, I think. He's a particularly egregious example. And yet uh, um, uh, we find, and you, you brought this up about bipartisan, we find in the Arab community a great, uh, a broad cross section of uh, political represent, representation. Mitch Daniels for a while. So you know, sometimes we yeah. we in our in our activist bubble believe that well, because Arabs have been immigrants, we would tend to think of them as Democrats. But it's really very broad based, bipartisan. Well, we have to remember that, you know, that, that of course, that the, that the public party was the party of Lincoln. And in the 1920s, uh, most uh, members of St. George were Republicans. You know, these the people whom you met there. And to this day, uh, Diana Najjar's son, David Najjar, is a Republican judge from Hamilton County. So you look at, if you look at all the politicians that are Republican, the Sununus, yeah. the uh, the Hoods of Peoria, Lahoud, Illinois, um, you know, you, you'll see uh, Spence Abraham of Michigan, uh, Daryl Issa of California. You'll see, you know, that it's uh, it all, I don't know if it's half and half, but the Republican Party and, and you know, even um, Donald Trump got some votes. Um, I don't know what the Republican vote was, but I think 24% of Muslims or something like that, based on the exit polls, voted for, for Donald Trump. So we can't, you know, we can't even... <laughs> We can't assume, that's right, that, that um, and, and what we want to do is make clear what our most important 
you know, issues. So, and the one thing we can't compromise on, and I appreciate the activism that you all have done and that you've devoted much of your life to, is we can't compromise on, um, on apartheid and um, Palestinian dispossession. This has to be, and I, I think the more we kind of soft pedal on it, we do ourselves a disservice. We have to be very clear about what, you know, what our goals are uh, and, and t by lifting up the voices of Palestinian people who want a nonviolent democratic change in Israel and Palestine. Any other questions? We have time for just a couple more. Yes, Terry, please. Um, the notion of Arab uh, often brings Islam into the, the person's mind, my mind, anyway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's only having visited Palestine that I came to be aware of the significant minorities within the Arab world that are Christian or Druze or uh, of other, other ethnic or religious background. But within the Islamic situation today, I'm observing a very fragmented um, uh, Islam in the United States. These communities that have come from other places in the world are having a difficult time uh, supporting one another, even in the mosque. Um, I see this in Fort Wayne and several different mosques. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Burmese have formed some of their own mosques. For instance, in Indianapolis, I went looking for a Shia mosque, and I only found one, and it's That's out correct. by the airport. Zainabia. And uh, Zainab, uh, Zainabia. Yeah. And uh, I've been there, and I took one of the Shia Afghan families there. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a huge mosque in, in Hamilton County in, in uh, Fishers that was just built. Mm -hmm. And I think it's multi-community uh, multi Kind of a mosque. But Sunni. It, it, it's Sunni. It appears to have people from lots it, of different It's multiracial and multi-ethnic, but it is Sunni in its doctrine. Yeah, it's Sunni. Orientation. Yeah, it's That's Sunni. Right. Most of the mosques in Indiana that I found are Sunni. That's so, right. So, anyway, just... The one I'm, in Michigan City was not, by the way, the 1931 one. The one that was Michigan actually, City. it was, it was, um, it included Sunnis and Shia, but the majority were Shia. Yeah. Uh, before 1965, most Sunnis and Shia prayed together because they didn't have enough mosques to. Right. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that's a very interesting, yes, and you are reflecting the desire of many religious communities for unity. And whether you are Christian or Jewish or Muslim or whatever, the idea that we should be one is a very, very strong desire. But it may not be the best business plan, honestly, in a country that does not have an official religion, because and there's a significant body of research that suggests that it is because of our disagreements and our diversity that religion can emerge to be such a powerful force in the lives of people. Think about it from a marketing perspective. If all I sell you are sh Chevettes, if I remember the Chevette, mm -hmm. okay, then, you know, then I'm only going to sell so many because it's not a car that I like. But if I could offer a Chevette you know, and a BMW, and a hatchback, and a station wagon, and an SUV, well, suddenly, I got a whole <coughs> line of products that I can choose from. And that's one of the explanations of the market economics of religion, is the reason why. Because we have no official church in the United States, unlike many countries in Europe, is that, I mean, as one of my professors, you get four people together, and you have your own Baptist church. And so... So if you think about it, it uh, diversification can actually be very good for a religion in that it can grow its number of congregations. All right. So despite the, the desire for unity, the fact that, think about how many churches in your own lifetime that you know of have split off and formed new churches, mm -hmm. right? And um, because of disagreements or something. Right. And so my perspective as someone who writes books about Muslims in America, is actually there is incredible vitality and growth among Muslim communities, whereas the congregations... Okay, so we only had a couple in the 60s. There were a couple hundred 
mosques in America. There are over 2,000 today. That's pretty good growth. So that's first. Second, uh, just because we have disagreements and diversity in our local congregations doesn't mean that people won't come together to support causes they believe in. If you look at Islamic Relief, Islamic Relief by far is the best funded Muslim American organization. You remember, you know them? I do. What is their budget? It's pretty high. It's, and so no, people from different per, per, uh, uh, theological orientations or you know doctrinal organizations that they still give to Islamic relief. So so it's not preventing this 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 diversity in the community is not preventing the uh, growth of uh, Muslim institutions or Muslim communities or congregations in in the United States. So I I, I guess it could be a, ha a case of half full or half empty. But I know that people have broken relationships. But we're all, in Islamic terms, Beni Adam. We're the tribe of Adam. Of course we're going to have broken relationships. That's just who we are as a species. That doesn't mean that the community overall is not, you know, is not still very vital and rich. That's how I see it, anyway. One of the, please, Linda. Well, I just ha kind of have a public service announcement. Is uh -huh. Pastor Martin still in the room? I, since we've been sitting here this morning, you're sitting in a very... Uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious neighborhood right here. And the local elementary school is Abbott Elementary. Children from all over the world. That is that many... the program? The TV program? No. <laughs> no. no. It should not be. It's not. It's very much yeah. Yeah. But many, many children here for whom English is not their first language, and many have come here from war-torn countries. Since we've been sitting here, I've gotten a note from the principal uh, that there was an incident at Abbott Elementary School yesterday uh, rumored had it that it involved a gun. It did not, he says. It did involve the Fort Wayne Police Department. So all I'm asking is that we would just be mindfully prayerful today that there are many frightened little children in that elementary school sitting about six blocks from us. So What was what was the situation? Some kind of it. They said we had an incident. With the police department. The police okay, department coming. had to come Thank you for to that. a child. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Just an observation what? as I walked in the door, there were two police cars slowly going down the street. Hmm. And maybe they were just, since it was early school day or something, maybe they were just patrolling. But I was curious even about that. So. I wanted to ask you, thank you, Linda and Barb, for sharing that. Please, Karen. Do you see or what do you see the pandemic or COVID having any effect on this journey? The, the uh, impact of COVID, the pandemic, on the Arab community? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Karen. Uh, for sure. Um, one of the things that the Arab American community nationally is advocating for is, even though people like my great, my great grandparents wanted to be white and they got their wish and so now we're counted as white on the census, um, there are many, many of us would like a Middle East, North Africa yes, category. Please so that we could track, in particular, health outcomes. Because uh, it doesn't seem that the health outcomes of Arab Americans are just the same as the general white population. And, and so, um, so that's going to be very important uh, going forward, and I hope that happens. You see, you know, oftentimes the response to the, uh, to the pandemic, there's not a one Arab response. It's going to be determined by domicile, where they are, their class, you know, their race, you know, all of the other factors that we see affecting, you know, their immigration status, all of, you know, and whether they have access to health care, mm -hmm. um, whether they have access to good in, um, Arabic or English language information about COVID-19. Um, you know, I mean, there were some people taking honey, you know, to, to cure, you know, in, you know, and so it, it, it's, it's very reflective of the overall American experience. It's fragmented. There's not one single, you know, Arab response. I wanted to ask you, uh, <clears throat> we're particularly sensitive because of our work of uh, the role of the Israel lobby <clears throat> in the United States. I, you know, I don't need you to talk about that as much, but... <laughs> But you, if I, while we were waiting for the video to, to uh, boot up, mm. I read your I read your uh, one page uh, article to the group. Uh, 
about uh, Arabs of Indianapolis. Mm. And you close by talking about how there's a growing, how being an Arab really means not only about uh, a pride in, in cultural heritage, but also growing political empowerment. And we've noticed that for a long, long time, there wasn't a, a similar kind of Arab APAC. You know, uh, yes. but, but there's a growing, though, coming together politically with regard to even across across uh, 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 political uh, political divide on many domestic issues, there's a growing political involvement with regard to certain uh, foreign policy issues. You want to just say a word about the growing Arab political in involvement in this country? Sure, absolutely. So I, I think really, you know, Pam Pinnock's book, The Rise of the Arab American Left, in the late uh, 1960s, the early 1970s, represented, this is when many organizations started calling themselves Arab, as opposed to Syrian, Lebanese. Now, in one way, while the Palestine issue tends to unite people even who don't call themselves Arab, the idea of sort of organizing under the Arab banner has become frayed a bit. Because as we see so many Iraqis, Lebanese, you know, um, in the, um, and Syrians, including refugees, but oftentimes just migrants, we see then the diversity of the Iraqi, Syrian, and Lebanese communities reflected. So we have religious, ethnic religious minorities who don't want to be Arab, yeah. you know, and who, who may have once sort of caucused with us, if you will, you know, but, but aren't necessarily wanting to do that now. The Copts from Egypt, for example, we have a Copt uh, congregation in... Um, uh, in Indianapolis, and um, most of the people there will say, I'm not Arab. Now, they speak Arabic. Arabic is their first language. That, but, they, but they do not consider themselves to be Chaldeans, okay, Assyrians, um, Syriacs, you could say. You know, it depends on how, on how you want to translate the word. Right? All, a lot of these groups are saying, we don't... And so, in many ways... I'm not sure that our major national organizations like the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, I think they're weaker than they were, for example, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the 80s and the 90s. Mm. Um, we interviewed uh, James Zogby uh, yep. during the pandemic, and I know his work has been about trying to pull together kind of mm -hmm. a, more of a, a political influence. He has tried, but it's not it's been... It's very difficult. It's very difficult, and it's, 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 it hasn't been effective in the way that we see our opponents, frankly, That's right. are much more are much more effective. And so, um, so I, I mean, what I was pointing to, I think, in that reading was that the reason why we started using the term Arab American was it was we did see it as a form of unity and power, but, there, but there's a lot of fraying there. And so what we find really more often, honestly, is that being American, Arab Americans tend to focus on their religion over their ethnicity, and we see a lot of the Muslim lobbying groups having more success and more and being better funded, people like the Council of American Islamic Relations, yeah, CARE, sure. you know, and, and then there are others as well. And, and there, and oftentimes, it's people are preferring to organize under their religious uh, banner rather than under their ethnic banner. So I honestly, to be... To, one of the reasons why I, I am still committed, in a way, to uh, obviously to the Arab American project, I don't exactly know what the fate of it is. Yeah. I, I do. Well, I will say this. Final thing is though, is that we will always be connected to the Arab world, and what you saw in the World Cup was an incredible amount of Arab joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Arab joy, and of course, it was made catalyzed by Morocco and by Moroccan and, and other people's solidarity with the Palestinian people. Yeah. And all of those who said that pan-Arab solidarity with the Palestinian people was dead because of the Abraham Accords, because of these corrupt governments selling us out, you know, no, the people in their hearts and in their minds are still committed to the project of freedom. And, I, uh, and it brought... Not the diaspora and the Arab world 
tremendous joy, great joy. And so we, you know, so I'm, I am sustained that I'm not totally wrong, I hope, by, by, by committing so much energy to the, uh, to, to, to the ERA project. But, but let's see over time, even final word is some of my um, academic colleagues, they don't want me to use the term Arab. They see it as an imperial identity. You know, um, and so uh, the preference, they're starting to really uh, advocate for Southwest Asian and North Africa, SWANA. <laughs> and, I, and I say to them, wait a minute, and how is that less imperial than Arab? I don't you know. But, but anyway, that, that is a very strong trend. Let's say thank you to Edward for being here. Thank you. And again, Edward's work and our hosting of him today was uh, partially funded by a grant from Indiana Humanities. Yay. Thank you.